in your sight. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Congregation, please turn with me in your Bibles for our scripture reading this afternoon to the Gospel of Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13, starting at verse 24. We'll be reading from verses 24 to 30. And then uh, from verse 36 to 43. And you will find there the familiar parable of the, of the weeds. Matthew 13, starting at verse 24 then. This is the word of God. He, that is Jesus, put another parable before them, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while his men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared also. And the servants of the master of the house came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have weeds? He said to them, An enemy has done this. So the servant said to him, Then do you want us to go and gather them? But he said, No, lest in gathering the weeds you root up the wheat along with them. Let both grow together until the harvest... And at harvest time, I will tell the reapers, gather the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. And then if you would just let your eyes drop down to verse 36. Then he left the crowds and went into the house, and his disciples came to him saying, explain to us the parable of the weeds of the field. He answered, the one who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world. And the good seed is the sons of the kingdom. The weeds are the sons of the evil one, and the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are angels. Just as the weeds are gathered and burned with fire, so will it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all lawbreakers, and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears, let him hear. Our song of preparation is number 52, or hymn 52, stanzas 1, 2, and 3.
once again, congregation, I encourage you to keep your Bibles open to Matthew 13, verses 24 and following as we look at what the Lord has to say to us this afternoon. Congregation of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, it gets to you sometimes, doesn't it? And we all, if we are attentive Christians, we have our moments when we experience frustration, sometimes discouragement, sometimes we even get angered by it. And I'm talking about the behavior and the attitude of, of people we consider fellow Christians. I'm talking about the unbiblical teachings of fellow churches or those who claim the name church. I'm talking about the conceding to the world that goes on so much in church circles today, the watering down of the gospel. I mean, today, we have churches that paint rainbows on their doors and on their doorsteps, who refuse to join with us or take a pro-life stance, who speak of God as he, she, or it without blinking an eye, who would deny a, a six-day creation, who find talk of sin offensive, and who would even go so far as to be unwilling to say that Jesus is the only way of salvation together with us. And sometimes even in our own churches, there may be those who spread heresy, who create division, who disturb the peace of God's people. And we have those moments from time to time when we wonder, how long, O oh Lord? We wonder, why does God allow this to continue? Why is justice not meted out sooner than later? And if we've experienced this kind of frustration, Jesus comes to us in this parable and he gives us comfort. And he teaches that the church militant, that is the church on earth, fighting the battle of the kingdom, continually engaging in spiritual warfare. Jesus teaches us that the church militant will be the church triumphant, and our enemies will be defeated. Jesus reminds us here that the final triumph and judgment will not come immediately, but it will come, and consequences will be felt, and rewards will be given. Our theme, as we look at the parable of the weeds this afternoon, is this, last day's encouragement for the good seed intertwined with the bad. Last day's encouragement for the good seed intertwined with the bad. We'll see two points again, our present reality, and in the second place, the future reality. But as Jesus bestows this last day's encouragement to the good seed intertwined with the bad, we see in the first place our present reality. In other words, we're looking at our set situation now in these last days. We're learning something of what life in the kingdom will be like as God's people in these last days. Now, the kingdom in this context would refer to the present age, the time when the between the first and second coming of Jesus. Now, theologians talk about the already and the not yet, and they talk about a, a present and a future aspect of the church, or of the kingdom. And they, when they speak of the not yet, it refers to the time when the kingdom will come at the end of time, at the judgment, uh, when Jesus will come to, uh, you know, and, and bring the kingdom in all its fullness. And he will appear with, with the angels and the blast of the trumpets, uh, tr trumpet on the clouds, and he will bring in the final consummation. And all things will be brought to perfection. And there will be a new heaven and a new earth. And Jesus, on that day, will be recognized as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. His glorious reign will begin. But this is the future. This is the not yet. But even now, there's an already. In other words, the future kingdom has broken into, the, into history with the first coming of Jesus. Already, Jesus has set things in motion, and he has established a means whereby we may now become subjects of the coming kingdom. Already, we march under the cross of Christ as kingdom citizens, and we are the army of the kingdom. But Jesus in this parable teaches us that, we'll, that there will always also be a, a dark side to these last days. And he, la he likens these last days to a man who sowed good seed in his field. And we would assume that the man took all the necessary precautions to ensure that the harvest would be bountiful and plentiful. The wheat is referred to as good seed. But then a new figure is introduced into the story, a dark and sinister fellow. 
his enemy. And he does his cowardly, dirty work while everyone is sleeping. The owner of this field is made the object of sabotage. Weeds are sown among the good seed. Now, theologians agree, for the most part, that the weed in question is most likely called darnel, which looks like wheat, but really contains a poisonous fungus. And it, it looks so much like wheat that they're actually called, the, the nickname for darnel is wheat's evil twin. And not to mention that uh, that weeds greedily steal the moisture and the nutrients from the soil. And the problem with darnel is that you can't distinguish it from the wheat until the wheat begins to blossom. But when it does, the servants in our parable, they take notice of this and they go to their master to request immediate action. The weeds must be rooted out, in, at least in their minds. But the owner of the, of the field wisely sees that more harm than good could come from this. He realizes that by this time, the roots are intertwined. And pulling up the darnel would result in the wheat being uprooted as well. And so he orders them to leave both the darnel and the wheat to grow together until the harvest. And we'll talk more about the harvest in our second point. But for now, we have to ask what this parable teaches about the present reality of the kingdom. And we find that explanation in the words of Jesus in verses 36 to 39a. Jesus says, then he, left the, well, we read, then he left the crowds and went into the house, and his disciples came to him, saying, Explain to us the parable of the weeds of the field. He answered, The one who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world, and the good seed is the sons of the kingdom. The weeds are the sons of the evil one, and the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are angels. And so Jesus teaches here that he himself is the sower. And notice that he calls himself here the son of man, a, a title that's actually taken from the prophecy of Daniel in Daniel chapter 7, verse 13 to 14. We hear this prophecy. I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven there came one like a son of man, and he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him, and to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. And so Jesus, in his ministry, took this title to himself, Son of Man, which spoke of his human nature, but also of his exalted nature. And here is where the Jews and even his disciples would have run into some confusion. Because in the prophecy of Daniel, as you heard, the Son of Man is said to receive authority and glory and sovereign power and everlasting dominion. In this parable, Jesus portrays himself as the sower who waits for the harvest to arrive. And so even in the taking of this title for himself, Jesus was correcting the thinking of the Jews. And he was indicating that the kingdom had come in himself, but there would be a delay before the triumph and the final judgment. The final extermination of God's enemies would come, but not immediately. In the meantime, the children of God and the children of wrath would coexist. Well, where, where does all this coexisting take place? Now, in the interest of full disclosure, I should t let you know that scholars take two different views on what is being spoken of here. Some say that Jesus here is talking about the world in general, the whole world, the whole earth. And some, including John Calvin, say Jesus is talking here about turmoil and disturbance in the church. I myself lean heavily to the view that this is talking about the church. And here's why. Because Jesus speaks here of the sons of the kingdom mixed with the sons of the evil one. And who are the sons of the kingdom but the elect who exist in the church? You say, well, the verse, but, but the verse says the field is the world. Well, yes, because that is where the church is situated in every part of the world. One holy, catholic, and apostolic church. And the good seed, sown by Jesus, the Son of Man, germinates and takes root and results in sons of the kingdom, the members of his church, spread worldwide. These are 
the children born not of natural descent, nor of a husband's will, but born of God. To use the words of John chapter 1, verse 13. These are those of whom Paul speaks in Galatians 4, verses 4 and following, who have received the full rights of sons because Christ has redeemed them. These are those who have been regenerated by the Holy Spirit so that they now confess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and are members of his church. But we're taught in this parable that other sons will exist with us in this world. And these others Jesus calls weeds, sons of the evil one. They are mixed in, even members of the church, but have not been given ears to hear and hearts to believe. The Apostle John speaks of them in 1 John 2 verse 19. In 1 John 2 verse 19, he says, Little they went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that it might become plain that they all are not of us. The Apostle Paul as well writes to Timothy of a great house possessing not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay. Or think of what he says in 2 Corinthians 4 of those to whom the gospel is veiled, those who are perishing. He speaks of them as being blinded by the God of this world, that is Satan, so that they cannot see the light of the gospel. Or think of Romans 9 verse 6 where he says, not all in Israel belong to Israel. Listen as well to 1 John 3 verses 7 to 10. First John 3, verses 7 to 10, John writes, Little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous, as he is righteous. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning, for God's seed abides in him, and he cannot keep on sinning, because he has been born of God. By this, it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. Now here again, we see the contrast between the children of God and the children of the devil. The children of God do what is righteous. They practice righteousness. They seek to please their heavenly Father. God's seed, that is his word, remains in them. Children of the devil... In, live to indulge the sinful nature, hating God and neighbor. You know, what's a good Reformed sermon without a quote from John Calvin? And here it is. Listen to what Calvin says uh, about this passage in his commentary. He says, As soon as Christ has gathered a small flock for himself, many hypocrites mingle with it. Persons of immoral lives creep in. Nay, many wicked men insinuate themselves in consequence of which numerous stains pollute that holy assembly which Christ has separated for himself. And, and Calvin takes the view then that this parable is actually in effect a warning to the church that as long as she exists, the ungodly and the unbelieving will rub shoulders with the godly and the believing. We believe that as well too. Think about Heidelberg Catechism, question and answer 81. We warn hypocrites, and those who are unrepentant, and that's in the church, of eating and drinking judgment on themselves. What is that but the good seed mixed in with the bad? And so we believe that as well. And that's the present reality of the church. We continue to coexist with those who might give the appearance of Christ's children, but really are his enemies. They're wolves in sheep's clothing, the reprobate mixed in with the elect, their canes pretending to be Abel's. And, and suddenly we have a calling to minister to these, to teach and correct and rebuke with Scripture as we have opportunity. But as long as we understand that along the way, we can expect that the church will always carry dead wood, to say it bluntly. There will always be pew warmers, Sunday Christians, and those with different goals and purposes to the true believers. 
it's discouraging sometimes. If you think about it, it can be frustrating, but that's why we need to keep in mind what Jesus teaches us here about this, the future reality, which is what we see in the second place. As Jesus bestows this last day's encouragement to the good seed intertwined with the bad, there will be a future reckoning for the righteous and the unrighteous. First of all, the unrighteous. And Jesus categorizes them in this parable as lawbreakers, literally those who do lawlessness. The seed of the devil do, in other words, what is contrary to God's law. In effect, they continue in their rebellion against the Creator and they work against His coming kingdom. In 2 Thessalonians 2, Paul talks about the secret power of lawlessness already at work in those who are perishing. Why? Because they refuse to love the truth and they delight in wickedness. And Jesus says that they will be eventually weeded out. They, together with everything that causes sin. And the Greek word, tra uh, translated causes in our ESVs, uh, it actually refers to anything that causes a person to stumble. Whatever devices were used against the children of the kingdom, whatever was used to try to trip them up, these things will be destroyed together with those who practice them. And so in these last days, we can expect to encounter people who profess to be Christians, yet they deny, say, the historicity of Genesis 1 through 11 and end up saying or denying a six-day creation, denying that Adam was the first man created, denying the fall and its consequences, denying that human sexuality is fixed, who downplay sin, even the need for personal holiness. In this life and in these last days, we will run into people who will criticize us for our orthodoxy, for our conservative beliefs. Sometimes false Christians even will entice the committed by their lifestyle, the way they live their lives. They, they make worldliness look attractive. Their relaxed view of the Lord's day. Their relaxed view of worship and worldly entertainment. And they will say to you, well, what's the harm? It's only a movie. It's only letting off a little steam. It's just business. Why so serious, son? In every congregation will exist those driven, instead of righteousness, driven by greed, selfish ambition, deceit, pride, envy, lust, the laziness of anti-intellectualism, tolerance, feminism. In every congregation they lurk. And they will secretly, sometimes blatantly, cause the faithful to stumble. Or they will introduce destructive heresies into the congregation. And I want, to take, uh, I want us to take note of something very significant here. Something that, make, uh, needs, that reminds us that we all need to sit up and, and, pay, and, and pay attention and be vigilant. Notice something very significant. The weeds are sown while everyone is sleeping. Now, in the Bible, as you may know, sleep is often associated with being unguarded, not watchful, careless. You know, remember that proverb in the book of Proverbs? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, and poverty will come upon you like a robber. And so, it is when the church is sleeping that the, the, the bad seed is sown. In other words... To put this in more practical terms, when we are preoccupied only with our own comforts and happiness, when church becomes routine to us, when we begin to take short, and it becomes habitual, when we be begin to take shortcuts in our own personal Bible reading, when our prayer life is anything but passionate and trustful, when the church stops learning and growing and reading, it is then that the enemy can sneak in and plant at leisure. And so we have to stay awake. As pastors, as elders, as parents, as young people, as Christians in general. And even then, we will not be able to, to completely escape discord and enmity. According to the parable of Jesus here. But here's our comfort. 
Jesus reminds us that, there, that those who cause such things will be eradicated in the final harvest. At that time, he says, the darnel will be uprooted first and they will be tied up to be burned. Everything that causes sin and all who do evil will be gathered up by the angels, he says. That is, the evil sons who up to this point were mingled with the true children of Christ will be extracted, separated, and receive their reward. They will be thrown into the fiery furnace. Perdition. Abaddon. The lake of fire. Hell. Whatever you want to call it. But beloved, while the tormented end of the wicked is sure, the bliss of the sons of God is equally sure. In verse 43, Jesus calls them the righteous. Those who by the Spirit embrace Jesus Christ in true faith as their only Lord and Savior are declared righteous before the judgment seat of God on that day. Jesus here draws his words, actually, again, from the prophecy of Daniel in Daniel chapter 12, verse 3. And we hear this prophecy, And those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the sky above, and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. The promise to the sons of the kingdom is that they will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. Now, boys and girls, that doesn't, don't take that literally. It doesn't mean that we will all shine, but we will be as the sun, as the sun shines. There will be nothing to hide, nothing to, to prevent us from people seeing us for who we are, nothing to hide our glory. There will be no shame, no guilt, no self-consciousness anymore. We will be on that day exhibited as God's prized possessions. This is our sure future. On that day, the children of God will be seen in all their glory and we will rise to to receive extravagant blessings from our Savior God. And we will dwell in the presence of the God of light who himself will cause us to shine as lights. The good news in this parable is the assurance that despite the present situation, the kingdom of God will ultimately triumph. The church in these last days will continue to be the church militant, fighting against evil, declaring the lordship of Christ to a hostile and a sinful world, sometimes even hostile and sinful people in our own churches. The kingdom of darkness will continue seeking to draw men away from Christ using devices and crafty schemes. The kingdom will continue to coexist with the anti-kingdom. But Jesus comforts us with the promise of this parable. The final defeat will come. Not that we are to take a completely passive role in the meantime. We must certainly resist evil. Jesus certainly commands excluding from the church those who refuse to repent of their sinful ways, Matthew 18. He commands us to destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God, 2 Corinthians 10 verse 5. We are to be contending for the faith. We are to be putting on the, 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 the armor of God, Ephesians 6, as we engage in spiritual warfare. To use the words of 1 Corinthians 5, we are not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother if he is guilty of sexual immorality or greed or is an idolater, reviler, drunkard, or swizzler, uh, swindler. Not even to eat with such a one. All the while knowing that perfection will not be found this side of Judgment Day. Congregation, in these last days, God in His infinite wisdom allows the good seed, that is the church, locally and worldwide, to be intertwined with the bad. But Jesus comforts us in this parable, reminding us, the sons of the kingdom, that we may work, that we may pray, knowing that, despite our many frustrations, Our glorious king will triumph. His enemies will perish. And the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of our father. To him be all glory. Amen.